this week I talked to my good friend Scott Berman about Platonism. So where I start is in thinking about ontology or metaphysics in general is uh, if you had to make a list of everything that exists, what would you put on that list and what would you leave off that list and why? Mm -hmm. And articulating the reasons is the hard part of metaphysics. Uh, and that takes the philosophical argumentation. So for me, the, the default view in metaphysics, in ontology, is, uh, is nominalism or spatiotemporalism. Uh, the idea that we start, so not nihilism, so I'm sure not even considering nihilism, that nothing yeah, exists. Nihilism but, isn't the default view anyway. No, but so the default view for me is just that what exists are spatiotemporal things, like you and me, the chairs we're sitting on, planets, uh, various trees, all, all the things we sort of take, sort of common sense objects, things that exist in space-time that, that science seems to be about, at least physics and chemistry and biology, anthropology, various things like that. Uh, and uh, then the question is, uh, uh, do we need to add anything to that list of things that exist? So on the list of things that exist are all the spatiotemporal things. Uh, do we need to add anything to that list? And so if you say no, that the only things that go on the list of things that exist are spatiotemporal things, then you've got two options, I think. You can either be a nominalist and say that there are no non-spatiotemporal things at all, nor are there any uh, universals, uh, or you can be what uh, is called uh, is contemporary Aristotelianism. So I guess, uh, you know, because the contemporary Aristotelians think that uh, universals exist and are real, but they are spatiotemporal. They're multiply located everywhere, everywhere that they are in every other thing that is not a universal in every particular. And so uh, I think that the, probably the best place to start for me would be to just uh, kind of talk about the, the classic sort of orthodox interpretation of the difference between Platonism and Aristotelianism. Mm -hmm. And that will help situate why I think classical Aristotelianism is different than contemporary Aristotelianism and the third mm -hmm. two vastly different categories. So, you know, one of the uh, best illustrations of the orthodox view is in Raphael's painting, The School of Athens in the Vatican, which is just gorgeous. And in the center of it, you have uh, Plato and Aristotle coming through this arch. And of course the arch is anachronistic since it wasn't really discovered till the Romans. But anyway, so you have Plato and Aristotle coming through this and you have Aristotle pointing up and, I'm sorry, Plato pointing up and you have Aristotle pointing down, and that's supposed to represent the idea that Plato thought that the forms or the ultimate natures of things were up in Platonic heaven, whereas Aristotle thought they were in things, they were imminent, they were here on earth. And uh, that, that view is how contemporary people think of the difference between Plato and Aristotle, that uh, it's largely fought on those lines and Plato's view comes out looking pretty absurd on that view because Plato thought that these forms are up in Platonic heaven and here, here's the more absurd part that they were supposed to be perfect examples of themselves so that mm -hmm. beautiful is the most beautiful thing there is and redness is the most red thing there is and equality is perfectly equal and triangularity is the perfect triangle and the human beingness is the perfect human and of course, that's a pretty absurd view because uh, Plato was trying to argue that there are these things that exist that are not in space or time. And they weren't located up in Platonic heaven or anywhere. Uh, he was just trying to argue that there's, there's more to reality than what's in space time. There are these non spatiotemporal things, uh, equality and redness and triangularity. And of course, human beingness, just to take one example, couldn't be the perfect example of human being because to be truly human, you have to be living and breathing and metabolizing. And something outside of space time can't be living or breathing and metabolizing because that takes time. Uh, largeness cannot literally be the largest thing there is because that would be a vast spatial entity. And of course, a non-spatial object could not be vastly spatially large. 
uh, red things cannot literally be red. I'm sorry, redness could not literally be red because to be red, you have to ref reflect the longest wavelength of visible light. And of course, something outside of space time can't reflect any wavelengths of visible light. So Plato himself did not think of the forms as being perfect examples of themselves. And it's somewhat embarrassing that anyone would think that he did think that. Um, but lots of people do think that. I mean, that's the, that's, the, um, that's the view of most people who know anything about Platonism who haven't read Plato, I think. So why, where, does that, um, where does that kind of bad understanding of Plato come from, do you think? Yeah, I mean, my understanding of where that came from was uh, Plotinus uh, is the source of the misinterpretation. And then he influenced Augustine, who then influenced all the thinkers in the medieval period. And then that got carried on to the modern period and now. So I think Plotinus was the source of the misinterpretation. And so Plotinus was like um, a neo platonist right? Correct. So he's what, when around, he's kind of like um, first century or something? Is that yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, That's cool. And um, yeah, like that. He's Maybe the second century. Uh, anyway, so he interpreted Plato that way. And I mean, the, one of the reasons why this is somewhat embarrassing is because as everyone who has read Plato knows, even the early dialogues, whenever Socrates asked the what is X question, the first answer out of the box is always an example. And Socrates doesn't so much as say that that's a bad example or that it's a false example. It's just, it's the wrong kind of answer, right? Examples don't explain why something is the way it is. Even if that's a true example, even if it was a perfect example, it wouldn't explain why the thing is what it is. So the forms are supposed to do some explanatory work and not just show things, right? So, uh, uh, so for example, I could show you a red ball, but that wouldn't explain what redness is. That would just show you what it is. In order to understand what redness is, you'd have to know it's the longest wavelength of visible light. And then you could identify other red things, even if they look nothing like a red ball. Right, they could be rectangular or they could be hard. Right, it doesn't matter, but you wouldn't get distracted by those things because you would know in virtue of what the red ball is red. Right, it's that the, that it reflects the longest wavelength visible light, which is the same wavelength for every red thing there is. So that's the idea. Or there are many different physical manifestations of paraboloness, and they all have something in common y equals x squared. Right, that relation between the x magnitude and the y magnitude is the same for all parabolas, and it's in virtue of knowing that algebraic equation that we can then identify correctly examples in space-time of parabolic figures. So, uh, so that's what he was after. And Aristotle himself agreed with Plato that there existed these non-spatiotemporal things, but he just thought that they had a different ontological status. So it wasn't that he didn't think that there were uninstantiated universals, he did. In fact, he's pretty clear in the posterior analytics that if uh, the universals depend on being instantiated for their existence, then that would make science impossible, right? So science could not work if universals could pop in and out of existence depending upon whether they were instantiated. Mm, and that, that's another really often repeated, um, I guess, cliche of Aristotle's view, that he believes that, that you know, it's a consequence of Aristotle's view. If all the red things went out of existence, so would red, or yeah. redness or something. Yeah, which does, it does strike people as like, it's kind of a crazy consequence of the view. Um, yeah. But yeah, okay, so that, this is a kind of, what well, we're seeing this through, okay, so if Plotinus is to blame for Plato's views, do we have a kind of, someone we can point to who's, who's misinterpreting Aristotle in the same way? I don't, I haven't spent as much time thinking about that one. Uh, uh, it, the, the thing that's really puzzling for me is that even if that was Aristotle's view, it's hard to see why that would be an interesting view. Like there's not a lot of explanatory oomph for having that view, as opposed to his real view, which is that universals exist, they're non-spatiotemporal, but they exist in a different sense of existence. The equivocity of being thesis for Aristotle is really the, the thing that it helps us explain things we want to explain on a vast range of issues. So for example, one of the uh, more clear ones is in philosophy of mind, right? So you have uh, Gilbert Ryle, great Aristotelian, 
who's criticizing Cartesian dualism for thinking that uh, minds and bodies both exist as if they exist in the in the same sense, right? So substance dualism, right? Uh, and he says, but he's also not a mind-brain identity theorist. He doesn't think that the mind is just nothing at all. He doesn't want to say it's another thing, but he also doesn't want to say it's nothing at all. And so Aristotle gives you a way of saying, well, it's another thing in a different sense of thing, in a lesser sense, right? So it's merely the functioning of the brain. Uh, it's not nothing, but it's not something either. Mm. Uh, and so universals exist, Aristotle thinks. Uh, he's a realist. They do exist, but they don't exist in the same sense. And the key thing here is that they exist in a lesser sense, in a derivative sense, in a secondary sense. And so it lets you have the same explanatory power of believing in universals, but for a lower ontological cost, right? It's, who doesn't who right, doesn't like right. who doesn't like a bargain, right? I mean, you can, yeah. <laughs> same benefits, lower cost, right? Uh, so it's not an ontological free lunch, but it's definitely reduced cost. Okay, um, good. So let's um, maybe we should s cycle back around somewhat to the beginning, though. So the the idea is that there's question about um, something to do so, so how, how do you set up the general framework because I don't want to put words in your mouth about this but so we're right. coming to this so the idea is, wow. is that so the default view is is just spatio-temporal things exist but then uh, if you push on nominalism hard and everybody does because in every generation some very smart person like Quine or uh, um, uh, Hartree Field. That's it, Hartree Field. Yeah. yeah. Right. So <laughs> Hartree Field, <laughs> super bright guy, really smart. Uh, so uh, you know William of uh, William of Ockham. These really smart people in every generation or every era try to defend nominalism and say we can get the same explanatory power uh, without having to commit ourselves to abstract objects, and it, it never seems to work out well for them. Um, uh, the, the sort of explanations they are forced to have to give, the sort of bending over backward, the very implausible verbal redescriptions of what's going on in all the different cases, uh, never commends a wide swath of people. Uh, mm. so it kind of seems attractive because it's got the lowest ontological cost on the table. Like everybody believes spatiotemporal things exist. That's and right. the promise of this theory is that like, that's all that you have to pay, right? You don't. You get all the right extra benefits, but only pay the cost that everyone has to pay anyway, right? And that's right. I agree with that. If you could, if you could, uh, give an account, explain how science is possible uh, with only believing in spatiotemporal things, then I would say go for it. Uh, definitely, I would be on board. But uh, uh, it seems pretty clear that we need to appeal to patterns or commonalities that are the same, identical in their, well, in their identity <laughs> across different regions of space-time and that they're not spatio-temporally the same. So if that's true, then you're going to have to admit that there are some things that are not necessarily, um, well, you're going to have to believe in commonalities at least. So then the question is, how do you unpack that? And so uh, contemporary Aristotelians think they can do that by believing in universals in addition to particulars that are multiply located, right? And so they talk about universals as being non myriological parts of particulars. And so, of course, if you know Greek, meros is part. So this is a non part part of a thing. Okay. Right, right. So <laughs> let me see. So the, so the, the, the first view is spatio temporalism, whatever, where, where the common thread is that. All they believe in is things that are spatio-temporally located or something yeah. like that. And then, the first, then they don't exist. Right, okay. And then the first version of that, nominalism, well, um, just simply says, all, like, that's just, there's just things, atoms, apples, chairs, whatever, no, nothing else in addition to that. Right. Um, but this kind of contemporary Aristotelian view says that, well, there, there is more than just these particulars. Um, there's something we're calling a universal but that that universal is a spatio-temporal thing as well, right? So, so is it that it's a weird spatio-temporal thing because the redness of my apple and the redness of my, I don't know, sofa or whatever um, is the same thing, it just exists in two places, correct? Multiply realized or something, right? Multiply located, right. 
Right, okay. And so, so is that, what, what's the main drawback of this contemporary Aristotelian view? I mean, is it just the weirdness of that view about, of universals? I think, you know, you, you can, uh, you know, when you look at a triangle, you know, the three sides are spatiotemporal and uh, the idea that the universal is also located in space time where the three sides are located as well as everywhere else. But it's not really the same kind of thing as the particular itself. Like, it just seems kind of weird. Like, how do you explain how this universal is a physical thing, but is, it's, it's a, as many people who believe this say, it's not a physical part, it's a metaphysical part. <laughs> but that just seems really weird. Mm. You know, to say, well, it's a, it's a non myriological part. Okay, but to say it's a non myriological part is just to say you haven't given an explanation. So what does it mean to be a non myriological part? I mean, myriology is just the, the study of, like, parts and wholes or whatever, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, so what a non myriological part, what does that mean, a whole? I mean, what, what else is there in myriology apart from parts and wholes? <laughs> I've asked this question. I haven't gotten a good answer, and uh, it's not like Platonism has an answer for absolutely every problem. So this could be something that could be worked out. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think that if there is uh, another view that's possible, we're probably better off with this other view. Uh, another problem for contemporary Aristotelianism, which I think is a more serious problem, isn't just that it's weird. Is that uh, they do seem committed to the principle of instantiation, and uh, the problem with that view, uh, I think, is number one: if they take the uh, the stronger view, which is Ar allegedly Aristotle's view, which it isn't, but the allegedly stronger view is that the thing doesn't exist unless it is instantiated at every moment, uh, as opposed to the weaker view which is uh, that, which is what Armstrong and Jonathan Lowe would say, is that as long as it's instantiated at some point in space-time, then it exists for all time, right? So, you know, that seems more plausible, because then you could say, even if, you know, you take all the white things in the world, like all of them, and you let Mick Jagger have his way, sorry, Sir Mick, you let Sir Mick have his way, and you paint them all black, uh, you know, then there are no white things, but according to Armstrong and Lowe, you'd still have whiteness, right? Because it was at some point instantiated. On the stronger view, you wouldn't. Whiteness would cease to exist. Mm -hmm. And then it would be puzzling how a scientist could know what white is if whiteness didn't exist. And so the, the weaker view is that as long as it exists anywhere and any at any time, then it exists for all time. And so that's better for science. But then it doesn't allow us to be able to explain how you could have uh, possibly instantiated universals that never are, so alien properties, as they're called, right? And so it does seem that scientists could discover, uh, you know, a kind of chemical, or there could be could have been a species that was instantiated. It just wasn't because of historical accidents, and so it never will and never was. But still, there could have been an organism like that had the historical situation been different, right? If various things had been different. And it seems like scientists could come to know that what that organism would have been like. Or, and so it does make that, it, it makes um, the continuity of scientific knowledge that makes lots of gaps. So we're sort of at the will of these historical accidents, whether there are these kinds of things that could be which seem like they should be possible for scientists to know, right? You could make these discoveries and then, you know, how about in the future, you could actually figure out a new way of making something that is possible, right? Like you could make, we call them inventions, but I mean, I would just say that we've discovered that these various features can come together. In nature, they just never happen to do, to do so but they could, and then we could maybe manipulate the world in such a way that such a thing could come to be. And it seems to me that a scientist could make those sort of discoveries. Uh, and so it seems uh, 
to hamstring science in a way that I wouldn't want to hamstring science. So the idea is that, so the objection is something like, on this view, um, if something is never realized, so let's say um, that an atomic bomb just happens to never be realized, but that physicists figure out how to make an atomic bomb, but that, I don't know, they're much more enlightened than we are or something, and they say, let's just like never do that or something. Exactly. Then the problem is that, so what's the problem then? That it seems like there kind of is this thing, right? We say there should be some property that goes along with like being a nuclear bomb or something. Um, yeah. So what is it that they've discovered and decided not to use, right? You can't say this thing of a certain type, you know, something which instantiates the property of being a nuclear bomb because that would be the type of thing that um, could only, there could only be a thing which instantiates a property if that if there actually is at least one instantiation of it somewhere. Otherwise, there isn't that category isn't available. Like right. that, that seems to be the objection. Yeah, exactly. And that seems it's, like a worrisome thing. It, sorry, go ahead. That seems like a worrisome thing, right? So it's not a knockdown argument. It's just I wouldn't want to hold uh, hold science hostage to that sort of uh, these sort of historical accidents. Right. Right. So the. The thought would be that in science, if it's getting at truths to some extent, then um, it's uh, the types of things that it's getting towards are the kind of, well, when it's carving nature at the joints or something, you think that like those joints are um, they're not kind of radically contingent upon us discovering them, they don't depend on us discovering them in any way, whereas in this case it seems that they do. And on the other hand, I guess you can sort of see this the other way around where like, sort of seems contingent that we did in fact make nuclear bombs but then you'd think well there's nothing contingent about nuclear bombs like the type nuclear bomb because it works on like the way that the universe works kind of necessary truths about the universe right? so, but yeah. somehow it's contingent on us actually making one for that type to, to be a real type okay yeah. so that, that does seem weird i, think I agree yeah. so what we're doing here is like placing worries on the scales so, so maybe you can just, is this, is this fair? So there's this kind of way of approaching metaphysics here where it's, um, it's not just a, this is definitely wrong and I've like kind of proved it um, once and for all that you can't take this view, but it's more kind of a um, pragmatic enterprise where we're kind of weighing up considerations and seeing which one has yeah. the best overall balance or something. Yeah. I mean, every every view we come up with is going to have pluses and minuses, and it's just whether the pluses outweigh the minuses. So, uh, you know, I don't think that it's imp I don't think that nominalism is impossible. I don't think it's incoherent. Uh, it's just that if you have it, you have to give up science, and so that seems like a not not a good plus. <laughs> seems like a huge negative, and so uh, um, so I'm going to say. Let's put that aside, right? Cl uh, contemporary Aristotelianism, again, it puts constraints, ham hamstring science in a way that I would not want to do. Uh, and so again, I'm going to put that aside. In, you know, in addition to the weirdness about the, being a non-mereological part. <laughs> hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay good. Too. But it's this, it's this hamstring science that really is the worrisome part for me. So then the question is, so then what do you do? So if these two versions of spatiotemporalism are false, or at least not worth the costs, right? The yeah. costs are too high, then what do you do? Well, then you say, all right, let's expand our ontology and put on the list of things that exist, non-spatiotemporal things. And uh, the, the uh, historically, the one that has seemed to be the least costly one, uh, the one that people find more, most plausible is that, yes, there are these non-spatiotemporal things, there are these abstract objects that are not located in space-time, but they are created by someone's mental activity, either mine or ours, our agreements, or God's. Uh, and so that we are creating them, and so they do exist in addition to spatiotemporal things. So I think constructivists think that abstract objects do exist in addition to, to spatiotemporal things. So for example, you know, take the later Wittgenstein, uh, you know, he thought meaning was use, but uh, I take it, 
I'm not a Wittgenstein scholar, but I take it that he thought that, uh, so you could use uh, a concept in the same way that I use the concept. We could both use it in the same way. And so since we are spatio-temporally disjoint, you and I are not the same spatio-temporal thing, there's a, a meaning type, a use type, that we are both instantiating when we use that concept in the same way. And so in addition to my using it at, as a token, and you using it as a token, there's this type that we share. So if that's possible, then, then there are these use types that exist in addition to the use tokens, and use types are not located anywhere in space-time, I take it. So even if we weren't thinking about them, they would still exist, but they are created by our uh, choices that we make uh, in our culture, in our lives. So that's why I think constructivists believe in abstract objects as well. Uh, we might need to pause right now because my cat's using his litter box. <laughs> that door. <laughs> so um, then constructivism, uh, the example of constructivism you gave with the like use tokens and use types um, strikes me as kind of quite different to what I was originally thinking you were going to explain here. So maybe this is just a fork in two different types of constructivism. But I thought that um, constructivism would be more something along the lines of what I might call conceptualism, where you think, say that, you know, red is, I don't know, some, something that like, um, maybe just something that people think about. And that the, the only reason that we say that you know, redness exists as opposed to just space with temporal things is because like we um, have an idea of redness or something. Um, so do you see that as a type of constructivism or is it a different category altogether? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking that it's the same view. I, I wasn't thinking okay. it was different than what you just explained. So uh, if, a, if what a, the meaning or what a concept is, is how we use the words in our culture, right? So it's thinking like, what is red? Well, red is whatever we all agree that con how that concept should be used, right? So it's to refer to these sorts of things. So we're, we are the ones, if it's the cultural view, we are the ones deciding how, what those joints of, of reality are. It's up to us, ultimately. Mm, I, I find this view really hard to even um, get in my sight sometimes. It's like, I'm not really quite sure what's, so, when we, so when you say something like, um, okay, so if, if we agree to think about, I don't know, if we, we say redness exists because it's like a collective practice between, say, the two of us that we, you know, we, we both say, look, this thing's red. So there's this like baptism where we say, look, this car is red, this apple is red, this sofa is red or something. And, and you agree and we use the word in the same way. Um, I'm just, I, I, it just seems to me like, is that, have we constructed anything or have, is this just the kind of convention that we agree to? Well, here? so here's the, <laughs> yeah, good. So here's the idea. So the question obviously is, what are the objects of our psychological states? So uh, the Platonist, is, as opposed to the Phrygian, is going to say that the objects of our mental states are extensional objects. And extensional objects include anything on that list of things that exist. So they can be spatiotemporal things or non-spatiotemporal things, right? Uh, or you know, universals, whatever. These are all extensional objects. The Fragian thinks that no, uh, intentional states, psychological states are not relations, they're intentional. And the idea there is that there are these intentional objects, right, propositions or meanings, uh, that are the same whether they're true or false. So there's the, uh, the what is it, the non-epistemic relation to the propositional content, the intentional object, then there's the epistemic relation from the proposition to the world. So there's two different places where uh, truth can come in, two different truth values. It's true that I believe something and what I believe is true or false, and those are independent of each other. That's the key bit of Freudianism. And... Uh, uh, so the Platonist doesn't believe in meanings or in any intentional objects whatsoever. So when I think about you, I'm not thinking about you indirectly via my Alex conception. I'm thinking about you with all your properties known and unknown. 
And so the idea is there, instead of having this entity, this intentional object that I have an infallible grasp of, I know what my own mental states are. Uh, I don't know what my own mental states are because I'm in a direct cognitive relation with you. And since I don't know you, right, you're a multifaceted thing. I could spend my whole life with you and never fully know you. Uh, that's just the way people are. Frege realizes, right, we're never going to know fully know another person, even though that's mostly, that's really what we ultimately want to know. We want to know our loved ones. And, uh, and so the way Frege unpacks this is by he, he says, look, uh, what is partial knowledge of a whole? Well, what partial knowledge of a whole is, is complete knowledge of the part. So instead of knowing, uh, you know, Alex, I know that he's from Britain. Right? I know various facts about him, and these uh, facts are very thin. Uh, so, uh, you know, knowing that you're from Britain is different than knowing that you're from the UK. If, some, if it's possible for anyone to not know that Britain is the UK, then knowing that you're from Britain is a different thing to know, different fact to know, than knowing that you're from the UK. So these are very thin. You either know them or you don't, right? So it makes having knowledge a lot easier because the objects of knowledge are simple. Plato wants to resist that and says, no, the objects of knowledge are complex things, and so we're just stuck at partial knowledge of the whole. We're never going to get complete knowledge of anything. And that's because he doesn't believe in intentional objects, which are created precisely to make sure that we can have some knowledge. Right? I see. Right, right, right. right. Something to know, right? So then the question here is, what are these concepts that we are thinking about when we think about these concepts, right? If you're a constructivist or a conceptualist, you think typically that these concepts, well, there's different, well, obviously there's many ways of going. You could go Kantian or Neo-Kantian. I mean, <laughs> this is a long, long discussion about what the objects of our mental states are. Mm. Uh, but uh, if, if you think, if you're a conceptualist, Okay, in the way that you were describing it. The question is, what is the status, what is the nature of these concepts? So if you're a realist, then these concepts are going to be what Plato and Aristotle would have called universals, right? And then that's not conceptualism, right? Because they're not, I mean, not, like you, you are no more a psychological mental thing than the, than the nature of redness, right? They're, they're both independent of me. Right? When I think about you, when I think about redness, neither one of them is like in my brain or anything. Right? You're not in my brain. Redness is not in my brain. Um, uh, if, if you want to say that these concepts are just brain states, then that would be going back to nominalism. And then you'd have the same problem of how do you explain how these different brain states have some, anything in common. Right. So if you're if you're going to admit that these concepts are not spatiotemporal, right? So you're not going to be a nominalist about what are the contents of our minds are. Uh, then the question is, how, how do they come to be these non-spatiotemporal things, or what are they? Right. Mm -hmm. The constructivist thinks that they are created or constructed by our mental activity. Right. We create these concepts in order to understand our world, as opposed to the realist who thinks that we discover these concepts, right? Yeah, okay, okay, so that does make it a lot clearer. I, I feel like there's this epistemological issue now with this, if, if that's what you, so, so let's say you have some thought about something. Um, so I, I think about the proposition that Scott is in America or something. Um, now the content of my thought, the proposition, um, or at least some kind of the universal that's involved in the proposition when being in America or something. Yeah. Um, if we say that the nature of that universal is itself conceptual rather than real, it's something that, you know, collectively society and me to some extent, say, has, has kind of created or constructed. Um, then I feel like how, how could I know? <laughs> like, how do I know that I've assigned the right meaning to the right conceptual thing right i mean what, what couldn't i have somehow made a mistake there or or yeah. like could i've constructed the wrong thing and put it in place and, and be using that instead where you're using a different thing right and so does it lead to this kind of skepticism here somehow no it leads i think it leads to humility 
I don't think it leads to skepticism. I just think it leads to humility. You don't get to know what you're thinking about just because you think you do. Right? So <laughs> the constructivist thinks that if I, if I think I'm thinking about something, then I'm right. I am thinking about that. And that's the point of the realist who says, no, that thinking it so doesn't make it so. No, no, it seems to me the problem is for the constructivist, right? Because, like, maybe I constructed the wrong thing. I don't know if this helps, but, like, for a while when I was a child, I used to be, um, people would say things like, oh, I've got a headache, right? Oh, I've got such a headache right now, such a headache. And I also, like, what's a headache? Like, I don't know what that means. Like, sometimes I bump my head, my head hurts, right? Sometimes I feel tired and then I'm, like, kind of grumpy. And I'm, Is that a headache? I, mean, I don't know. I never took a paracetamol for a headache, even though, like, people I knew took paracetamols for headaches. And I think only later in life, I think, weirdly, right? It's just one of these things slipped through the net. I never really worked out what the word goes to. I think later on in life, I was like, oh, that's a headache. I get it now. Like, I've got that concept and it's like something for me. But I think I could have misplaced it, right? And, and assigned it to being in a bad mood or something. And then said to people, oh, I've got such a headache right now. And I just mean I'm you know, dehydrated or I'm tired or something. And I would have made this error. This is the thing I'm... And so, like, if all there is to the um, concept is something that we construct ourselves, it seems like, uh, how do I know that I've, con I've got, since it's a mental item, it kind of exists in my mind, and then and it, it exists in your mind as well, I suppose, and I'm, I'm worried about, like, synchronizing these two things. Like, it seems to me that I, I, I might just use the word headache and apply and have the wrong concept or something. Whereas, at least for the realist, the idea is that, like, there actually is a thing independently of us, it exists. And all, all there is for the conceptualist is um, to using the right word is kind of just synchronizing um, concepts correctly. Like actually, yeah, yeah. you know, to having the, the same headache concept as you rather than bad mood or something instead. Right. So I think, sense? yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. So the, the response to that, I think, would be that, uh, that I am a consequentialist. So you have a hypothesis as to what uh, people are talking about when they use a certain word. And then through time, over time, you, you are testing that hypothesis to see whether the concept actually refers to what people seem to be saying it refers to. So I think that you are coming to know what headacheness is <laughs> as a realist over time as you're s sussing out what how people are using that word. So the, the idea here is, okay, so now we're getting to philosophy of language. Okay, so the question here is, why do human beings name things? Why do we come up with concepts? Why do we bother, right? And so I think that for the realist that there's uh, a reason for it, and it's not that we do it for no reason at all, that we do this because uh, uh, naming things allows us to communicate. And we think that it's to our advantage to be able to communicate, okay? And so here's what the realist is going to say about successful communication, that uh, successful communication requires that whatever words we use to refer to whatever's going on in the world has to truly differentiate things in accordance with how they're different mm -hmm. or name things in a way such that how they're really the same. So, uh, so names aren't true of things simply because we agree to them. So not linguistic conventionalism. Uh, we agree to things because they provide some community, they, you know, a solution for a coordination problem. Right. And so if we agree to call things certain names that in fact are not like that, then over time we're going to change how we name things. So, you know, um, we could name half the woofy things and half the meowy things dog and the other half of the woofy things and meowy things cat. And I could say, Hey, I got a cat. Didn't get a dog. And he was like, okay, what did you get? Did you get a woofy thing or a meow? Thing, right? I mean, we're not cutting nature at the joints there in those agreements. So we can agree to call things certain things, but unless what we agree to actually truly differentiates things in accordance with how they're different, those names over time we're going to see are not going to work out. So my name is truly Scott because my parents agreed to it. If they had agreed to call me uh, Merle, my dad's name, that would have been a false name unless they called me Merle Jr., right? 
So Scott is true, true name of this insofar as it differentiates me from other members of my family. Scott Berman, true name of this insofar as it differentiates me from other members of my community. Human, true name of this insofar as it differentiates me from other non-human animals. Animal, true name of this insofar as it differentiates me from other non-animal living things, and so on. So this thing has many, many true names, but the reason that any of the names that are true are true is because the name successfully differentiates this from other things in accordance with how it's different. So that's, and I am a consequentialist, so we discover, we have hypotheses, let's call this big thing that swims in the ocean fish, and then over time we realize actually that thing has more in common with us than it does with fish, let's call it a whale or something, let's give it a different name, right? Um, so initially, in the early 80s, doctors thought they had found a new form of cancer in the Bay Area uh, of California. And then over time, they realized it wasn't cancer at all. It was a wholly different kind of disease. So they came up with a different name, AIDS. And so this is how we're trying to do it. Okay, so that's, I think, as a realist, how, how we, uh, why we pick various names and change those various names that we do. And so I think that what we're trying to get at is what those real natural joints in reality are. The constructivist thinks that we make those decisions, or I make those decisions, or God makes those decisions, typically it's we make those decisions, those linguistic choices, arbitrarily. It's ultimately up to us what names we want to give to things, what, how we want to divide up the world. And since there's no direct cognitive access to the world, uh, it's always mediated through these intentional objects, there's no way to know if any way of carving up the world is any better, really, than any other. So forget about it, right? Forget about the world. It's just up to us, right? And people who control language literally control reality for that linguistic community. And so that's what I'm thinking constructivism. Is. Right. So it makes me think also of, um, so it, there's this issue with nominalism too, right? So you could say um, something like, uh, is this right? So the nominalist will say something like, um, look, red is just like all the red things or something, right? That, that there's nothing else to all the red things, like redness in addition to that. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that you you can take any collection of objects. You can you can talk about like the set of things that they instantiate, and like well, doesn't there be, doesn't there become a kind of um, like isn't it just arbitrary that the red things go in the red category and we we sort of somehow privilege that like, and think that that's special as opposed to just some gerrymandered collection of like my toe and like the Statue of Liberty and like your glasses or something. Like, we do think there's nothing in common between those, but like. For the nominalist to explain why the first group, like the apple and the strawberry and the red sofa or something, it should go together, um, he has to appeal to something that really exists, right? So to make it not arbitrary. Um, otherwise, it's just a kind of, well, I just, you know, this, well, what can they even say? You know, as soon as they try and appeal to something, they have well, to Well, right. Well, what they, say, what they say is that it's brute. There's a brute resemblance. And so if it's brute, you don't have to explain it. But the problem here is that we can explain it. <laughs> so why not have the explanation? I mean, science has is offering us an explanation. So why put your head in the sand and be an ostrich and just pretend like you don't have access to something that is really, really helpful? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really helpful. So yeah, so they're just going to say it's brute. That's what they okay. say. So for both the conceptualist and the nominalist, though, there's this temptation to say something like, um, well, instead of just having there being no fact of the matter um, as to the kind of correctness of these classifications or just saying it's brute without any further possibility of explanation, there's this um, temptation that the realist is saying, which is a, like, look, the reason why choosing like this set of all the red things, you know, privilege, be, you know, because it actually carves nature at joints, essentially. So it's, it strikes me as it's quite similar to um, uh, there's this argument for realism in philosophy of science by Putnam with the no miracles argument, right? Which is something like non-realist theories of science um, can't explain why science works and yet without it just being the miracle that it does. And so the realist is the only candidate out there, which is kind of like, you know, the reason it works is because that's what it's like, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
then that's the root of the explanation, right? That there seems to be on offer with the realist position. Does that seem fair? Totally fair, yeah, completely fair. So, so the problem for me with the constructivist is, uh, is this, is that uh, the, I think the constructivist is claiming that the ultimate truth maker of any of these true claims is someone's will, someone's, someone's mental activity, either mine or ours or God's. And uh, so I think that constructivism is in itself incoherent. It, it, because it, I think it's got that bootstrap problem. It, it, it implicitly has to accept what it explicitly rejects. So in order for someone's willing something to be true to make it true, I think it had to, before they ever willed it, had to be the case that this conditional, if someone, you know, the relevant person wills such and such, then it becomes true. Only if that conditional is true, independent of anyone say so, would it be the case that when someone wills something, those two things together then make it true. But you can't, willing it so just makes it true that it was willed. It doesn't make what you willed to be true. So, for example, we could agree uh, that I'm five foot nine, but that agreement wouldn't make what we agree to true. It would just make it agree to, right? What would make it true, what, we, what would make what we agree to true is that I am five foot nine. Turns out I'm not. So what we agreed to was false, right? I'm only five eight. So, right, the constructivist of any sort, I think, has this bootstrap problem. So I do think that view is internally incoherent because it has to explicitly reject that there is this conditional, which is going to have to be true by nature on pain of infinite regress um, to make an act, a mental act, be able to make what is willed to be true. So I would say that constructivism is not wrong just because it makes science uh, less possible. I think it is something internally incoherent to it. So then if that's true, then I think you've only got two other possibilities. You've got either Aristotel classical Aristotelian realism or you've got Platonism, Platonic realism. And uh, I think that people have traditionally said, historically said, that if I'm going to be a realist, I'm going to go with Aristotelian realism because it's a less radical form of realism. Uh, that it's a, it's called moderate realism. It se seems like common sense realism as opposed to this crazy platonic realism, right? Okay. You, can you spell out the um, classical Aristotelian view again, then, just seeing as we've got here? Right. So the classical Aristotelian view is is the idea that yes, there are universals and they are non spatiotemporal, but they exist in a lesser sense. So as an example. Uh, uh, um, well, I gave the one with the mind, uh, or, you know, suppose you get home and you see on the place where your house was, uh, this is nice, neat pile of bricks and nice, neat pile of boards and a nice, neat pile of mortar. Uh, you don't respond to that by saying, Hey, someone took the shape of my house, police, <laughs> right? Because you don't think that the shape of the house is another thing besides the bricks, the boards and the mortar. You think of the shape of the house as merely the way those things are organized. But the idea is that those that that merely the way those things are organized is not nothing. Because when you get to your place where your house was, you don't say, oh, good, my house is still here. Right. Right. So it's not nothing, but it's not something either. So this organizational principle is not another thing besides the bricks, the boards and the mortar. It's this thing that exists, but in a lesser sense. So um, uh, just like the functioning of the brain is not another thing beside the brain, like Descartes thought, it's not a, this mental substance, it's merely the functioning of the brain, uh, which is not nothing, but it's not something, because when you die, your brain is still there, but you're, there's no mental goings on, right? And uh, uh, so it gives you this explanatory power. And then say neo-Kantians, uh, they think that, uh, Regulative principles like toleration are not substantial theories of the good. They're mere regulative principles. So it's this it's this mere right move. It's like it exists, but it's merely it's this it's this lesser thing. It's not a thing like you and me, but it's not nothing either. Um, mm. And for Fragians who believe in intentional objects, the same idea, right? So one of the advantages of Fragians view Frege's view is that you can explain 
how you can think about things that don't exist, like Santa Claus or uh, various other things, uh, phlogiston. And uh, the idea is that you have these intentional objects, and then the Platonist is going to say, but wait a minute, I mean, don't intentional objects exist? Those aren't nothing. And the Fragans get, well, I mean, yeah, okay, they, they exist, because otherwise you can't use them to explain anything, but they don't exist in the same sense. They're not like an extensional object. I mean, that would really be something, right? But they're not nothing, but they're not something. They're merely intentional, right? So it's that same mitigating, ontological mitigating move, right? It's merely this, right? Uh, and that's what Aristotle was trying to get at. He wanted to have the explanatory benefits of... Uh, of being a realist, being able to explain how science is possible, how we can have knowledge of mind independent things. But he thought Plato, he thought Plato went too far in thinking that the forms existed in the same sense that you and I exist in. We are things that exist in a primary sense, in a full, like we are sort of how Frege thought of it, like we are saturated uh, as opposed to uh, concepts that are unsaturated, right? They're, they're not nothing, but they're not like full things. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, so Aristotle wants universals to exist for real, mind independently, whether they're instantiated or not, they exist eternally, uh, but as uh, unsaturated things, as incomplete things, uh, as things that exist in a secondary sense. Uh, so that's how he can explain the unity of, of particulars. So for Plato, uh, this would be a heap of things. This is a, a human thing. This is a five foot eight thing. This is a, a white thing. This is a, all various things that it is, a clean shaven thing. And so it's a heap of things. And that doesn't look good, right, to have a heap of things. You want to say, look, no, this is just one thing. And so Aristotle can explain how this is one thing because, I mean, it's obviously very complicated, but the idea is that if you have matter and form existing in different senses, then they kind of fit together, right, in a way that the, the form unifies the matter into being one thing, right? Just like functions are not other things, they're ways of getting from one thing to another thing, right, for Frege? Yeah, so some forms um, are compatible and some are not, right? Like you can't have the form of squareness and triangleness at the same time, right? You can't be going up and down at the same time. It is these, um, so... Isn't there then That's some kind of, is it, doesn't that push you into a regress or something where you have to say that, well, there's this like form of forms, which is the compatible forms and the way they exist is a third way, right? And it's not, a, you know, this, because those forms exist in a compatible way, right? So that, there's that. Yeah, that I mean, form. there are, there are, there are forms, uh, there are abstract objects that explain uh, why certain forms can, can be coinstantiated and other forms cannot. Definitely. Okay, so is that a second order form or is that just a normal first order form that just, you know, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. So I guess one way of thinking about it, instead of thinking about there being some things that are complete and some things that are incomplete, two radically different sorts of being, Plato would just say that all the forms are incomplete and they combine mm -hmm. or don't combine in the way, sort of like the way chemists think about the, the valences of different. Uh, uh, electron uh, atoms or molecules, whether they can fit together or not. Uh, so they're all gappy in that way, and just which ones can fit together and which ones can't depend on their natural, those natural gaps. That's the idea. But getting back to Aristotle, so Aristotle thinks <laughs> that there are these uh, different senses of being that are are incommensurate. So as he famously says, there's no genus of being. So there's there's no kind of thing that the being is, which is true of all beings, right? Plato thought that there's the nature of being and that all beings, that nature of being is true of them. If they don't exist, then that form is not true of them. And that's true for spatiotemporal things and non-spatiotemporal things. Uh, and Aristotle thought there was no genus of being, that being is said in many ways, that there's a substantial kind of being, there's a qualitative kind of being, a quantitative kind of being, a place kind of being, time kind of being there's 10 different categories and so uh and and there's no one kind of being which is true of all 10 of those right and so uh he can aristotle can actually that theory can do a lot of explanatory work 
Uh, it can stop regresses, uh, which is great because you know you can't group things together if they exist in different senses, so that blocks the regress. Um, explains the unity of spatiotemporal particulars. Uh, it explains how you can have this sort of functionalism in philosophy of mind. Uh, it has a lot of, of attractive features. However, it's got one major negative feature, and that is that the view is itself self-referentially incoherent. Why do I say that? Well, so uh, Aristotle's view is that there are 10 different senses of being, and uh, so he thinks that there's uh, being a substance, being a quality, being a quantity, being a place, being a time, and there's no such thing as being in itself. That's true of all of them. He thinks that the primary sense of being is being a substance, but the other nine categories do not have that in common. He says they all point to it but they don't have it in common because that would be like a genus over all 10 of them, okay? All right, so if there's 10 different senses of being, Aristotle thinks there's also 10 different senses of being one. So there's being one substance, being one quantity, being one quality, being one time, and so forth, right? There's no genus of oneness either. Uh, so he also thinks that in addition to there being a different sense of one for every category, there's also a different sense of being one and the same as. So there's being one and the same substance as, being one and the same quality as, being one and the same quantity as, and so forth. So there's 10 different senses of being the same, and likewise, 10 different senses of being different. So you can ask the question when Aristotle says, uh, uh, there are 10 different senses of being, you can say, in what sense of same or different would it be true to say that there are 10 different senses of being, right? Or that the, the, the sense of being a substance is, is not the same as the sense of being a quality, okay? So in what sense of same is that true? Well, you can try all the different senses out, but none of them are going to work, right? So you can say, you know, uh, Socrates is not the same substance as Alex, right? But you can't say Socrates is not the same substance as the color white, because the color white is not a substance. So you, there's no sense of same that you can use to compare them, to say that they're the same or different. So the idea there is that there, since there is no sense of same or different, in which you can even say meaningfully, let alone truly, that there are 10 different senses of being, then it turns out that if it's true that being is said many different ways, then it's meaningless. And that strikes right. right? So if your view is meaningless if true, strikes me as a negative you can't just bite the bullet on. Right, so can Aristotle get out of this mess? Yes, he can. If Aristotle would admit that there's an 11th sense of being that goes across all 10 categories, uh, then all those sentences could come back. You could compare things cross-categorically, right? Uh, but then the problem is whose view is that? Well, that's Plato's view. Plato believed that being was univocal. So Aristotle can maintain his Aristotelianism and be incoherent, or he can become a Platonist. Choice is his, no one's got a bend with <laughs> So uh, I, for obvious reasons, I think that the most plausible, reasonable move is to just embrace Platonism, right? If you want the full benefits, you gotta pay, you gotta pay for it. You get what you pay for. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, and I also think that this idea that being is equivocal is very non-naturalistic. Um, and so I think that strikes me as a bad view if you're trying to explain how science is possible. To have to commit yourself to something that's not natural just strikes me as a bad idea. So that's why I opt for Platonism because all the other views that are less than Platonism seem to have too many problems. Either they're incoherent or they just can't get science off the ground, and that's just a non-starter for me. So, mm. so that's why. So, okay. Platonism. Maybe then you can say a bit more on to flesh out. So, so it's not just Platonism wins because all the other argue, all the other positions lose, as it were. But there must be some kind of so. So, by Platonism, you mean something along the lines of. Um, in addition to the spatiotemporal things that exist, there are non-spatiotemporal things that exist. Correct. Those things are the kinds of things that those spatiotemporal things instantiate. So in addition to there being vacuum cleaners and strawberries and dogs, there are um, things which are called um, 
which are the types of things that those instantiate. So vacuum cleanliness is a type of thing Correct. that this vacuum cleaner instantiates. Okay, so um, is, so how, how else would you flesh that out? I mean, or is, is that all that there is to the view? What else is there to it? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, the idea is that uh, there's a lot of consequences to the view. If that's true, then uh, number one, we're committed to there being non spatial temporal things that are the way uh, that that restrict uh, the kinds of things that were that can be instantiated in space time, and so then the question is, what are the things that are instantiated in space time? That's a that's a definite problem for the Platonist. Like, how do you explain spatiotemporal things? Uh, I mean, there may be other problems for believing in non spatiotemporal things as well. But uh, suppose that it's the most plausible view there is. What are spatiotemporal things? So the idea would be for the Platonist is that that uh, nothing in space-time has an essence, that everything in space-time is accidentally what it is, that, uh, and that all spatiotemporal things are not, as Aristotle would call them, substances. He would just, I mean, he doesn't use this terminology, of course, but a contemporary Platonist could say that spatiotemporal things are just dynamical systems. And uh, dynamical systems, like the same region of space-time can have a plurality of different dynamical systems in it depending upon what scale of measurement you're looking at. So for example if you look at the angstrom length scale there are seven billion 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 atoms here. If you look at the one meter length scale there's one human being. Uh, depending on what scale of measurement you're using you're, there's, you're going to be identifying different dynamical systems in the same region of space-time. Right, so, uh, and that all of these dynamical systems are what they are because of various historical accidents. There's nothing essential about this, like this, this thing here isn't essentially human, it isn't essentially white, it isn't essentially five foot eight. It is human, it is five foot eight, it is white, but it is so accidentally, right, or contingently. There's nothing necessary about this being anything. Um, uh, so, Plato or Platonists do believe that spatiotemporal things are genuine things. They're not illusory things. They're real things. They're just really bad objects of knowledge. That the forms, the abstract objects, are really good objects of knowledge because they're stable, they're reliable. Things in space time are just not reliable. They're not good objects of knowledge. This human thing will cease to be human. So you don't want human beingness to cease to be human. I'm sorry. You don't want human beings to cease to be human beingness, right? You don't want the nature of what it is to be human to change into something else. It's okay if a human being ceases to be human, right? That happens, unfortunately, all too often. Uh, white things can cease to be white things. I can get a suntan, right, or whatever. Uh, but uh, you don't want the nature of suntanness to change, right? It, otherwise, you couldn't know. It wouldn't be a reliable object to know. So. Um, uh, I don't know what else you want me to say. So I guess spatial well, things are just dynamical systems that are constantly changing over time. They're bad objects of knowledge. Uh, there can be a plurality of different uh, kinds of spatiotemporal things in the same region of space-time, depending upon which scale of measurement you're using. And these different uh, things that we use to measure are these abstract objects, right? So human beingness, if we know human beingness, then we'll be able to identify human beings. If we know what the nature of an atom is, we'll be able to identify atoms. If we know what the nature, right? If we don't know what these things are, then we won't be able to identify them in space-time. They'll still exist in space-time. We just won't ever come to know them. So, okay, so I feel like um, there's two sort of, objections to Platonism, which um, I want to see what your responses, responses are. So, I mean, on the one hand, the thought would be something like, if um, as a kind of temporal dynamical system or, or whatever, the, the way that you would describe me on this view, if, yeah. if that's what I'm like, then um, how is it that I, and so if the, so, so if the, the type of human um, characterizes me, or well, I instantiate that type, right? That yeah. on the one hand, like, how does that affect, how is that um, instantiation, like, 
how does that work? So I'm think, thinking the problem is like with yeah. substance dualism, when you say something like, look, if there's two completely different things, right, there's the mind and the body, and then the, the response is like, but how does the, that totally different substance um, interact with it anyway? And I know that instantiation isn't supposed to be a causal relation, right, but yeah. it's still some kind of relation. And then how, it seems like it, the, the more on, the more distinctly you make this ontological difference between the particulars and the universals like that, the, the more difficult it is to explain. And the second one is a sort of epistemological counterpart to that. Like if they're so removed, right, and I don't, they don't cause me in a kind of direct sense of cause, how do I, how can I know about them? Like right? this kind of swirl of space time stuff that I am, how can I ever like reach out and find these, um, yeah. Okay. Things even though science should be about them, how how does it ever get there? So the, those are the two, but the metaphysical and the and the epistemological issue. All right. So the metaphysical problem, uh, the nature of instantiation. I think the most important thing to keep saying is that it's not causal, which you did say, right? So uh, the nature of gravity doesn't cause the apple to fall from the tree. Uh, it just explains the behavior that it has, right? So uh, parabolaness doesn't cause any parabolas to come into existence. Human beingness doesn't cause any human beings to come into existence. So all the causal stuff going on is all in space time, right? It's not, there's no causal relation. So what is that relation? And I guess I would say that, uh, it's an identity relation. That, that is that the, the abstract objects give the identity. Uh, but that still seems a little mysterious. You want to know like, how does it do that? Uh, but it's not a causal. It doesn't do it by causing anything. And so then I'm still not giving much of an explanation. And the only thing I can say, and this is not a great answer, but this is the best one I can give, is that this problem is everybody's problem who's not a nominalist. <laughs> this isn't uniquely a platonic problem, right? Even if you're trying to explain the nature of predication in terms of set theory, right? That that's still a little puzzling. What's that relationship between, you know, the members of a set and a set? And a set's an abstract object. What's the is a member of relation exactly? I mean, let's let's get some kind of is it causal? Well, it's not causal. What is it? I don't know, right? If you're a if you're Aristotelian, what's this belonging? Or if you're Jonathan Schaffer, you know, you say that universals or properties are pinned to the the space time continuum. Like, what is the nature of this pinning? Like, I, I don't know. But it, 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 it's, the, it's everybody's problem except the nominalist, and I think they have worse problems. So it's not a uniquely uh, difficult thing for the Platonists. This is everybody's problem. And I think that it will get figured out in time. I think that we'll think about it as long as we realize it's not just the problem for the Platonist. Uh, with respect to the epistemological problem, I know that was just dodging the problem, but I'm just thinking like, look, this isn't just for the Platonists here. Everybody has this problem if you're not a nominalist. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the epistemological problem, it's uh, it's really puzzling why this is so difficult to see. Uh, you know, uh, Benassara phrased this problem um, initially, and I, I guess you don't need any kind of special mental faculty to come into mental contact with these abstract objects like i think girdle uh, argued that we had some special mental faculty uh it's just reasoning i mean just <laughs> just inductive reasoning i mean like you reason like the sun looks like this this day it comes up in the east it comes up in the east and then you reason that it's always going to do it that way you know i mean you, you reason to a proposition that you don't have any empirical experience of in itself, right? You just reasoning. You're reasoning from things you use. You're reasoning about your experiences to these things you can't see, right? And so it's just a feature. It's just a, a, one of those benefits of being able to reason that we can come into intellectual uh, relation with these non-spatio-temporal things. So it's not any if, – if the nature of reasoning – is not mysterious, then what I'm thinking is going on here is not mysterious at all. So when scientists reason about how to explain the patterns that they're finding, they're coming into cognitive contact with these non-spatio-temporal things. Uh, do they know what they're coming in contact with? No, they don't. But that's what they're coming in contact with, right? I mean, I think, I think 
referring to abstract objects is really easy. It's knowing what you're referring to that's really hard. So right now, I'm thinking about the cure for cancer. I've got the cure for cancer in mind. Man, I wish I knew what that was. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I really wish I knew what I was thinking about, but that's what I'm thinking about. Right. It's not that hard to make reference to things. Uh, what's hard is to know what you're making reference to. Uh, if the things you're re referring to are the real things themselves and not just this sort of two dimensional uh, sort of representation that I, I have full access to. Right. Uh, if it's the real, the multifaceted thing that I am thinking about. So okay. I don't know if those answer the questions or not, but. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, they do to some extent. I'm, I'm sure that there will be people who listen to this who find um, Platonism objectionable for something like those types of reasons that I gave. And I, th I think that everybody finds the most difficulty with those types of things. I mean, did you yeah. say something like, look, there are these things, right? And they're not like things that exist in space and time, and immediately people become suspicious about that type of, um, yeah. you know, every other type of thing that we postulate that's like that, I think we're quite right to be suspicious about it. You need good yeah. reasons to take, take on board those types of things. But if I say, like, there are ghosts, or there are, I don't know, there's some kind of supernatural entity or something, you know, these old school theories of mind where it's a completely distinct, non spatial temporal thing yeah. altogether, whatever. Yeah. So I guess what I would say in response to that is just that the the great thing about that the great thing about Platonism, I think, is that the reason for believing in these abstract objects is that it makes science possible. Mm. The reason for believing in these other things, no bearing on that question at all. Uh, it's also the case that the these abstract objects. They can't be conscious because if it's outside of space time, it's outside of time, there's no consciousness because consciousness takes time. And so, right, they can't take an interest in me. They don't know what, they're not aware of me. There's no consciousness at all for these things, zero. They can't, they're not causally efficacious in any way whatsoever. So, you know, you don't have to worry about ghosts or supernatural beings. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, do I, do I think that we know for sure that there aren't any such things? No, we've got to have a little humility here, but I think that we don't have any good reason to believe in them either. Not mm. yet, anymore, right? I mean, I think that, you know, you, the, to throw in the towel and say, okay, we got to believe in these things to make everything work out. Like, we're not even close to being there. So it may be in a long time from now that we just cannot close some, ver some gaps and we're going to have to believe in certain things like that, but we're just not even close to being there yet. Right. I mean, the whole history of scientific progress shows that we do make progress and we do. So I think I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm just saying that there's no good reason to throw in the towel yet. So, right. With respect to those kind of supernatural entities yeah. or whatever. But there is we should throw in the towel with regards to. Um, Platonic entities like we should, we should you're an advocate that we should we should just believe I yeah I think so yeah I mean so do you take yourself to be because I always find that when it's a, any kind of metaphysical thing like this like it play, if someone said to me are you a Platonist I'd be like well yeah it sounds like a kind of big decision you know it's like <laughs> I'm gonna pick Platonism right and then I have to have, I have to be a Platonist now or you know determinist or something like that. I don't know you know I don't know don't know what's going on um, at the most fundamental level of reality, right? But I mean, do you see yourself as like being a Platonist? How does that strike you? I mean, are you comfortable with that label? Yeah, very, very much so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I guess here's what I think. I mean, I think that uh, you can't get anywhere if you don't put your feet down and start walking in a particular direction. So uh, the way I see it is that it's a hypothesis. And I've put my feet down on that spot and I'm, I'm just gonna see where it can take me. I'm just gonna see what sort of problems it can solve, if it sounds, if it's coherent, if it helps us solve various problems that we wanna solve in a good way, uh, then I think that's a good way to make progress, right? You gotta, you gotta like make a hypothesis of some sort and then see what the consequences are. So given 
what I laid out before, that these other hypotheses, these other starting points don't seem to me to be worth trying anymore. Then I'm thinking, okay, let's try this and just see if we can push it. I mean, another reason for, for this is that I do think that because Platonism has been dismissed because of this caricature view of Plato, where he believed that the forms were up in heaven and that they were perfect examples of themselves, yeah, that view is stupid. Right, that view is genuinely moronic, and I understand why people throughout history have pretty much not been Platonists, right? Because that is a crazy view. But if, I think if genuine Platonism were actually part of the discussion, we could actually make a little bit more progress on these views. I think so. That's why I want to defend it because I want to reinsert it into the discussion in a way that is a more plausible version. I think it's historically more plausible. You know, exegetically more plausible, but I don't really care to defend that view. Any, I don't really care. What I really care about is that the view, whether Plato held it or not. I mean, I do think he held it, but whether he held it or not, I think the view actually is helpful and is explanatorily powerful and is worth our consideration. And pretty much most people don't even bother because if they're gonna, as I said, if they're gonna say, "All right, I'll," if I, I see I have to be a realist, I'll be Aristotelian, right? And I just don't think that that is a plausible view of either sort, either the contemporary version or the classical version. So mm. that's why I'm pushing back. Um, I don't think constructivism is as popular now as it used to be. Uh, in the 90s, it was very popular uh, in academia, and it's still very popular in the humanities and the social sciences, uh, not in a science, yeah, right. but, um, but I think in philosophy, it's not nearly as popular as it used to be. Uh, it's well, still very popular in English and history and other various disciplines, but in philosophy, a lot of people have have gone past constructivism, and pretty much now people are just arguing about nominalism or Aristotelianism. Uh, hmm. Those two, as far as I can tell, if they're if they're doing metaphysics, one of the nice applications of this view, I think, to ethics, say, which you didn't ask about. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, please. Is that there are these objective truths about what's morally right and wrong. It's going to be in terms of goodness and badness. And because uh, a Platonist is not going to be a Kantian, right? Um, so uh, uh, the, the, one of the main reasons why when you talk to your undergraduates that they say that they're cultural relativists or they're constructivists of some sort, that it just depends on what your values are. There's no right, objective rights or wrong. It just depends on how you're raised. Uh, one of the reasons they say that is because people disagree about what's right and wrong. And so therefore there's no objective truth about it. And then you bring up to them, yeah, well, but scientists disagree about things. It doesn't show that there's no objective truth there. People disagreed about whether the earth was round or flat and they were people who thought it was flat were wrong. We just didn't have the right, you know, perspective yet. Uh, didn't have the right observations. And so then people say, yeah, but see, in ethics, uh, you can't come up with observations that can prove one side wrong or right. So with science, you can get empirical data, you can get evidence to prove someone right or wrong. Whereas in ethics, you know, you can give all the, uh, you can list out all the observations of someone shooting another person with a gun, like the blood flowing out of them and their heart stopping and blah, 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 but you're never gonna get it's wrong, right? There's no observation of its wrongness. Uh, and so that's really why people are constructivists. It isn't because people disagree, it's because those disagreements are not resolvable using empirical evidence. So then the question is, all right, well, what is the nature of empirical evidence? And so if uh, the nature of spatio-temporal things is that they're dynamical systems and whether things you can see things or not are going to depend upon whether you're using the right measurement the right scale right then it could be the case that you can actually see the moral rightness or wrongness of an action if you use the right time scale so if you use if you're just med looking at things at a moment then you're not going to see it right it's not you're not going to be apparent to you right but if you look at a longer time scale if you're a consequentialist then you could see it. It would just look, it would just be something that you have to look at at a larger time scale, like evolutionary mm -hmm. patterns. You don't see them at a moment, you can only see them at a larger time scale. Same with ethical patterns, good, good patterns or bad patterns. They only appear at larger time scales. And so then the idea is that if we have the right background theory about what in fact is good and bad to do, then we could resolve these things empirically 
if we just measure it correctly uh, using the right time scales. So that would be one consequence of this view that we could actually plausibly figure out uh, what's in fact best to do uh, for a human being. And okay, so that's, um, so you're solving the problem for the um, ethical Platonist. So let's just see if we can sketch the view out, because I mean, I think that's a really interesting way of approaching that problem. Um, so, but the view in particular would be something like there are lots of different I don't know, actions, I guess, and like punching people in the face and stealing from them and stuff, and that's like bad or something. And then there's like, I don't know, what's the, like, giving to charity? I was, what's the opposite? Punching someone in the face, <laughs> like stroking their face, I don't know, whatever, that's pointless. But you know, the idea is that there's all these actions like helping people and being nice and charitable and generous and stuff, and they're all good. And so there's, they, they, just like the, the red things, the apple and the sofa and the black and clean are all instantiate good, uh, redness. All of those different action tokens instantiate goodness as well. I mean, it's basically, that's the ethical Platonist view, right? Correct. But they only instantiate these things over a larger time scale, right? And so the idea is that human consciousness is such that we can only be aware of things at a moment for however long that is. I'm not sure how actually long that is. It's over a very small time frame, but it, it is not at an instant, obviously. Um, and so ethical actions don't appear at that short time scale. So the idea will be that we have discovered over time that being kind to people leads to better consequences than punching them in the face. These are things that we've discovered. And that's why we say, hey, you should do these things. Right, because we have discovered these things, uh, you know, like being being mean to people, you know, makes people not want to be around you, and then you don't have any friends, and it seems that having friends is an important thing for a good human life, and so you want to avoid being mean to people, right? Because we've discovered that these sorts of things have these sorts of consequences, and I do think we have discovered those things over time. Um, and there would be an objective truth about those features that we were just we're discovering these things. So that would be one consequence of it, right? So, um, so you know, giving the details on that obviously is very complicated, but uh, that's one consequence of a Platonist view you know, that you could resolve this alleged issue, right? The the idea is that you know all observations are theory laden. And so whether you can see something depends upon you having the right background theory. If you have the wrong background theory, your observations are false. If you have the right background theory, then your observations are true, right? So it isn't that there's no truth. It's just that you have to have the right background theory in order to actually get the true observations. So you have to, you have to get rid of the idea that observations are brute, right? Observations aren't brute. They're all, always theory laden, right? So, yeah. okay, so it's easy to see with science, right? Because all scientific tools are constructed on the basis of a theory about how to get the data, right? So rulers are based on the idea that the shortest distance from two points is a straight line, that space is flat, right? Not curved, right? That the telescope is constructed on the basis of theory of refraction uh, and all sorts of things. So it's easy to see all scientific tools are constructed on the basis of a theory about how to get the data. So if you get the wrong theory about how to collect the data, you're gonna get false data. Right. But it's also the case that our own experience of the world without using tools is also a theory laden because we have various background theories about what uh, what our experiences are. So, you know, when I was uh, 18, uh, so I was on, on the uh, third date with my now wife and uh, I told her embarrassingly that I loved her. And she said, no, you don't. And I said, yeah, I do, I'm telling you, that's how I feel, I'm telling you I love you. And she says, no, Scott, you don't love me, right? So apparently I, I thought I was having a loving experience, but I was really just having a lusting experience, right? So I was 18 and somehow I mistook love for lust. I mean, who would have thought, right? <laughs> no one's ever done that before, I'm sure. No, no, right, so I, I was just barely behind the, behind the uh, eight ball there. So, <laughs> so, uh, so even our own, our awareness, our own understanding of our own experience is going to partly depend upon us having the right background theories about what it is we're experiencing. So um, whether something is right or wrong, whether we can see it or not, is going to depend on us having the right background theory about what 
makes an action be right or wrong, good or bad, depending upon mm. what the background theory is. That's the idea. Yeah, okay. And I'm quite sympathetic to that um, way of looking at things as well. Um, so it, here's, here's a sort of, seeing as we're going down this route, I, I take it that there'd be some cases that you'd say the Platonist explanation of things isn't right and an anti-realist view would be right. I mean, it'd be unusual if you were realist about everything or something. Right? So let me say, maybe if I say to you, um, we both sit down in a restaurant and order the same food, um, but I don't. I say, oh, this is this is not nice, and you say, oh, this is delicious, right? That, um, like with your student who's objecting to the, you know, there are these disagreements, and that means that this isn't real. Like in in this case, we want to say something like, it's it's not really a case of it looks like disagreement, right? But it's not actual disagreement because there isn't really any kind of non subjective, you know, real platonic object of niceness or deliciousness or something, which these foods are instantiating, right? I mean, it could instantiate the platonic forms of like, you know, hot and I don't know, this much of salty or whatever, the flavors that it has, presumably that you could sort of see them as instantiating objective properties, but the tastiness of it, right? That That's just, that's up to me. So you're gonna, you follow me down that, that far down that route? Or do you, do you want to see tastiness as a, a platonic object too? <laughs> yeah, I do actually. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I am a about everything. Yeah. So uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the idea here is that all truths are, are mind, are ultimately mind independent. So that's not to say that we don't contribute to some part of it, it's just that ultimately what makes it true is not just whatever we think, right? So the, the idea is beauty is not in the eye of the beholder, right? So uh, I know that looks bad <laughs> to say that, but I think that, um, let me see if I can put this in a good way. Um, here's, here's, I guess, the best way of putting it. So, uh, there is some objective truth about what makes something tasty or not. And whether it appears that way to you might depend on the various features of you. And you might be in a certain physiological state where you're unable to determine to, to get its tastiness, right? Mm. Uh, so you're wrong about it's not being tasty to you. Uh, and uh, um, that could happen. There's, there's, in other words, we're not infallibly right about anything in our own experience. So um, maybe this would help. So, uh, so give me a, give, give me a. I mean, I don't, I don't know any British um, sports people, but you know, take some like large sports person, right? You know, like a, a very big one who's very active, physically big, physically big, being physically big. Yeah, physically big. Um, I don't know. I, I don't care about sports either. So um, you know, yeah. let's just imagine that there's this big sports guy. Yeah, this big okay. sports guy, right? So and you know, so I don't know what the actual number is here, but suppose for him to be healthy, he needs to eat ten pounds of food a day. Uh, whereas for me, if I eat ten pounds of food a day, I would be unhealthy. And so. Uh, the idea there is that what health is for both of us is the same, but given the particular features of our body, in order to get healthy, we need to do different things, right? So this big mm. sports person has a high activity level and they're very big and me, I'm small and I do not have a high activity level. So, right, but it's perfectly objective as to how much food we each need to eat to be healthy, right? Which, why we go to the doctor, because they take those measurements of our body and our activity level and our genetic history and blah, blah, blah. And they come up with this answer, like, okay, you need to eat this amount to be healthy, right? So it's perfectly objective, even though it looks different, what health, how health manifests in each of us may look different, but what it is is the same for both of us. So the idea is that what tastiness is or what beauty is would be the same for all of us, but how it manifests may be different depending upon the features of our body, right? So that, that could explain the difference, but what health is and what beauty is is the same for all of us, it's just how it gets manifested could be different. How it looks could be different. So, so like the way that my dog will eat um, stuff that to me seems like you know she'll 
sniff out a, an old chip from underneath a, a leaf and yeah. um, gobble it up like it's a really tasty treat, Mike. But I, I, I physically couldn't eat that. I would, you know, I'd be sick if I tried to eat that. Right. But given her, I don't know, palate and digestive system and stuff, like the, the tastiness is just some kind of like match between the food that's going in and like the type of thing exactly. that they are and whatever. A good match for you or something is what tastiness is. Yeah, yeah. okay. That's yeah, that not, sounds quite plausible as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm quite happy. You know, I'm quite. I have no problem with Platonism in particular. Um, like I said, I, I feel like um, my only issue is that I, I don't know. I sort of feel that people's um, like identities being bound up with metaphysical positions sometimes strikes me as just kind of bizarre you know it just it just seems or feels wrong or something to say that um but i think I, maybe i'm just that type of person it doesn't like committing to things like it feels like committing to a, some type of institution or some kind of typology or something i, I always want to be like independent i guess you know i don't want to be like oh now i'm a platonist i have to you know go and do the platonist things or or, or whatever maybe i'm just scared of um we don't, have, we don't have any meetings. <laughs> <laughs> there are no meetings. Right? You can go. <laughs> uh, I guess. I guess the reason why I find it helpful is because, uh, well, just as I said before, it's a hypothesis, and it feels like I can. I have something to push off against, right? And so it feels like I can actually maybe make some progress as opposed to just kind of like, well, maybe this is right. Maybe that's right. Maybe this is right. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And so it feels like I, if you just, I, I don't know, I'm just very linear. So I just want to go off in a straight line somewhere and, um, and see where, see where it takes you. I mean, I don't know. It could end up not working out, but, uh, and you know, I want to be honest about it. I mean, I used to be a Kantian like everyone else. And, and I, I realized I had to reject it because it was based on something fundamentally flawed. So, um, you know, in ethics. And, um, and so it just, I think it's just a way to try to make progress, <laughs> right? Put your feet down somewhere and just start walking. Because if you don't put your feet down anywhere, you're not going to get anywhere. You know, you're just moving your legs around and not getting anywhere. Maybe yeah. that's a good thing. Maybe not getting anywhere might be a good thing. Maybe we need less people to be getting places. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, uh, well, maybe we have I feel like I, well, I want to like make you know make progress, entertain hypotheses, see where see where the pathways go or whatever, without like planting my flag anywhere in particular and saying this is where my this is where I live or whatever, you know, like. Sure. Um, and I feel like sometimes when people say things like I'm a Platonist or I'm a whatever, what they mean is I. Um, if asked a certain question, my response will be along these lines, right? And that's kind of quite different to, and it, that's fine, I mean, I get that. Like, I like defending this position or something is what they mean, um, which is cool. But like, when, you know, if you say something like, um, I don't know, I guess if I say something like, I'm a vegetarian, I guess what that means is something like, if I'm given this menu, I'll, I'll only choose these options or something something along those lines too. Like I, I don't need me. I guess it's a disposition too. But. Well, I mean, I guess w one of the things that is helpful is that it also signals to another person where you're coming from. And so I have found it to be extraordinarily helpful because very few people are Platonists. And so they often will say, they push me, right? They, they're going to say, oh, wow, really? And so then they will ask me <laughs> challenging questions. And that I find really, really helpful because otherwise I wouldn't get those questions. So by, mm -hmm. by telling, communicating that to other people, I get to have conversations about these sorts of issues that I wouldn't necessarily get to have. So, uh, you know, I find it really helpful to uh, engage in these sorts of conversations with people, mostly who disagree with me, which is mostly everyone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and also the other thing that's kind of nice is that uh that you get to talk about 
fundamental questions in the discipline as opposed to just working out some of the details further downstream. Mm. And so if you think, as I do, as we went through, that, that some of the fundamental starting points are flawed for various reasons, I'm not as interested in working out some of the issues in those other frameworks, right, downstream, because I already think the place it started is not a good place to start, right? So if you say you're a Platonist, then you can have that discussion at that initial starting point in a way that you can't otherwise. And so I find that really helpful because I am pretty sure that I could be wrong about almost everything, about everything I think. And so I, if I'm wrong about any of my reasons for rejecting nominalism or contemporary Aristotelianism or constructivism or classical Aristotelianism, I wanna hear about it. And I'm not gonna hear about it if I don't say I'm a Platonist, then people don't engage me with those more fundamental questions. So in some way, it's a way, it's a way of um, double checking, triple checking that I rejected those other views for the right reasons, right? Which is important because if I'm putting my feet down here and I've put my feet down in the wrong place, then I'm screwed. And so I want other people to help me relieve me of that problem, right? And I have been fortunate enough to find people like that who are willing to engage with me at that level. Not a lot, but some. Most, mm -hmm. most people just kind of shake their head and just like, really? <laughs> wow. And is it mainly for the metaphysical and epistemological type of objections that I was bringing up? Yeah, always. Yeah. Always. Yeah, and so I think that, that those are gonna seem troublesome uh, the metaphysical problems are going to seem troublesome if you haven't gone through the other possibilities and what's wrong with them, right? And that's a long conversation. It's not many people who are willing to commit to talking about that whole path. Yeah, definitely. And I think most people will say something like um, that they'll have like science um, means that, they, you know, you can't have these entities that are non spatial temples. I mean, kind of naturalism means. Right everything in space or temple or something like that. Um, and I guess, so do you distinguish between, um, do, do, would you say that then Platonism is a non-naturalistic theory or is it that once properly reinterpreted Platonism is a naturalistic theory? The latter, definitely, definitely. I see, okay, cool. Yeah. Well, okay, so look, you're in the process of writing a book about all of this, so, I assume that pretty much everything that we've covered in this is going to be spelled out more in that. Um, do you have a working title for the book? I mean, <laughs> Platonism? Uh, I mean, the uh, working title is just, you know, a contemporary defense of Platonism or something like that. But mm -hmm. I, I don't have a title um, for sure worked out. No. I'm, ha I'm happy to hear suggestions if you have any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay great. if anyone has a good idea for a title then maybe. yeah i mean i was thinking of uh kind of no no nonsense platonism you know just because all that nonsense about what people thought plato was is not part of it so i don't know something like that mm. i will think and i will put my punning hat on and see if i can come up with a funny pun based Every title yeah, yeah. I'd like that. Okay, good. Well, we're uh, approaching the two hour mark. So I think that's probably, um, we should probably wrap that up here. But thanks very much for coming on and giving me a lot to think about and a good defense and explanation of Platonism. So thanks very much, Scott. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Appreciate it.